Um, remember that in last class, class number four, we mostly focused on linear regressions. Um, this time we are moving ahead and basically uh, focusing on classification techniques. Okay, so in this case, uh, what we are trying to understand is what happens when the prediction problem that we have, instead of just trying to predict a number, like say for example predicting the height or the weight of someone, we want to predict um, a given class. So whether, for example, an email is a spam or not, whether someone might suffer a heart attack or not, or even a multi-class um, setting where, for example, we want to classify um, between different uh, political affiliations or affiliations to different political parties and so on, right? So I've divided this class into three parts. The first part is going to be a general understanding of uh, what classification is, okay? Because most of the classes, or the remaining classes in this course are going to focus on classification techniques that assume, you know, a supervised setting in which we have um, labels for the samples that we are trying to classify. Then the second part will focus on logistic regression uh, with a few examples in R, and then we'll move on the, to the third part uh, about naive base. Okay, so let's start <clears throat> with the first part. Let's um, recall a little bit. We, we already covered this um, in our first class, but then let's recall a little bit what do we mean by classification, right? So when we are talking about a classification problem, we have a universe X, okay, where our samples come from. We have a fixed set of classes, those are the dependent variables that we will try that we are going to try to figure out. We have a training set of labeled samples, and we have a testing set. Okay, so the way a classification works is that given that we have a training set X with different labeled samples, and by labeled samples I mean that we have sets of independent variables that have a label as being uh, of one or another class. What we do is that we basically learn a classifier out of that training set, the classifier C, which we will use to give labels to the testing set. Okay, let's give an example. Imagine that we have our universe, in this example it's going to be a medical database, so we have different information, so we have age, heart rate and blood pressure for different patients, we've measured that for each patient, and then also for each patient we have a label uh, uh, about whether the, the patient has heart problem or not. Okay, so for each patient we're going to have age, heart rate, blood pressure, and then an extra feature, the dependent variable that we are trying to predict to classify, which is going to be whether it's a Y or an N, depending on whether the, the patient has heart problem or not. <clears throat> As in any type of classification or prediction problem, we are going to have a training set in which we have the labels, so take a look at the heart problem column, okay, in our training set we do have information for each patient but we also have the label regarding whether the patient has a heart problem or not. And then we have a prediction set or a testing set in which we do not have information for the heart problem. Okay, this is a typical setting in which in a hospital where we have multiple patients, we build our classifier based on the patients that we have seen and when there's a new patient coming in, um, we can run the classifier and try to understand whether that person might or might not have a heart problem based on the, the patterns that we have learned from our previous patients. So what a classifier would do would be uh, based on the age, heart rate and blood pressure, can we fill out the heart problem column with a Y or with a no? And how accurately can we do that? Classification problems and classifiers are all over the place in our lives. Okay, if you think, for example, about uh, problems like um, everyday problems like language, language identification, right? I mean, is this um, document or is this web page written in English or in French? Okay, remember that, for example, Google offers translation services, or I don't know, even Facebook. Okay, when you look at a message on on the wall, um, they can translate it for you. Okay, so identifying the type of language. Is a multi-class classification problem where you have you know as many classes as languages are there in the world. Detection of spam pages. Imagine that you get it's not only a page, imagine that for, for emails, okay, for web pages. Is that a spam or is it not? In this case it would be a binary classification because we only have two classes. Okay, but what features could we think of that would allow us to detect spam? So maybe the number of words, maybe the word order, maybe the types of words, okay? And how can this be used to build a classifier that will determine whether something is a spam or not? 
Detection of sexually explicit content. Uh, content. Okay, so imagine, for example, this um, a very relevant application nowadays when, when you think about any blogs where you know people uh, start commenting on the content of the blog, or when you think of any uh, social media network. Uh, where sometimes people, based on their anonymity or on, on a fake user, they start harassing somebody else on the network. Is there a way that we can detect this type of content? Okay, In this case, it would be also a binary classification problem. Or even sentiment detection. What's the sentiment of that text? Is it positive or negative? Sentiment um, classification or, or analysis can also be um, defined as a regression problem if we want to determine, you know, with a number from 0 to 1, you know, what's the sentiment, or from minus 1 to 1, what's the sentiment in a given piece of text. Okay, but it can also be framed as a classification problem. There are different types of classification methods. Okay, there are manual methods, rule-based methods, and statistical or probabilistic methods. This course, as you can imagine, is going to focus on the last, the third um, element, the statistical or probabilistic methods. Okay, but let me uh, walk you through uh, why the other two might make sense in some scenarios. When we think about manual classification methods, okay, think for example um, <clears throat> about small data sets, small medical data sets say, certain types of, of illnesses that are not um, widely spread or widely known, okay, uh, for when you need to characterize small sets of patients or small sets of users, it might be the case that you need information from, from experts and it might be the case that this can be done manually because, you know, it's not a lot of users that we are labeling. So again, if, if the size of the sample is small, it might make sense to have a set of experts who are going to label um, the data that we have. And basically, we don't need any type of automatic method. We don't need any classifier to do that. Okay? However, that's not always the case. Okay? Again, we might think about really small medical databases for rare illnesses. We might think of, um, I don't know, a faculty search committee that's looking you know, between top four or five candidates that can be manually done, but in general, the number of samples that we have is going to be much larger. So there are two other approaches, rule-based and statistical or probabilistic automatic-based. Okay, rule-based, um, you might have also heard about expert systems. Okay, so rule-based is basically a way of mm, kind of defining um, an automatic way of determining uh, a label, but the rules are built manually. Okay, the rules are built by experts. What this means is that, what this means is that you might have a black box saying, okay, give me whatever features we have for the classification. Give me age and heart rate, okay, and blood pressure, pressure, and I will give you whether the person might have a heart attack or not. Okay, it's automatic in that sense, but the rules are mm, manually built. Okay. So, for example, I'm showing here an example of a uh, rule. In this rule, we are saying that if the age is above 65 and the heart rate is above 70, or if the age is above 60 and the pressure is above um, 140 and 70, then a heart problem is a yes. So that person is going to be labeled as having a heart problem. Okay? Who built this rule? Probably a doctor. Okay, so these uh, rule-based systems are typically built by experts in the domain where the rules are going to be applied, but they consist or they can be defined as semi-automatic um, classification methods. In these cases, obviously, the classification accuracy is um, high. The rules have been very well crafted. Okay? Um, it can be poor if the rules were uh, not correctly defined, which is what happens oftentimes when the, the so-called expert is not an expert and the person who is defining the rules doesn't really know what he's talking about or she's talking about. But in general, you know, the most relevant problem with um, this type of rule-based method is that any time something uh, new needs to be included in the model, it requires building it into the model and obviously maintaining it. Is there a way that we could automatically learn those things and whenever we have more features, also automatically learn them without needing experts to update those? There is. And this is where statistical or probabilistic methods come in. Okay, These methods, the ones that we are going to see in this course for the largest part, part of this, uh, this course, it's basically supervised methods. Okay, So we are talking about um, automatic ways of uh, labeling samples. Um, as of being or of one class or another one. 
uh, it's supervised because we do have those labels, okay? And um, it can be binary or multi-class depending on the number of classes that we um, that we have um, in hand to label the samples that, that we are uh, manipulating. Um, these methods, obviously, I mean, we still require some type of labels, but the interesting thing is that once we have the labels, the model can be learned, rebuilt, and maintained without uh, the need of uh, any expert, okay, as opposed to rule-based systems. In these courses, I was saying, uh, we're going to be looking into several of those um, statistical classification methods. So today, we're going to be looking into logistic regression and knife base. Next week, we'll look into decision trees and support vector machines. Okay, and these are some of the most popular classification methods that are being used nowadays. And before we go into, uh, into um, logistic regressions, I also wanted to discuss um, something that you might also come upon if you start reading about these methods, and that I think that it's important that you have clear in your minds what's the meaning of each of those concepts. Okay, So we've talked about regressions and classifications, we've talked about different types of classifications, as of being manual or rule-based or statistical. There's also a, a very interesting concept, which is Mm, or a taxonomy, which is uh, or attempts to divide the different machine learning techniques into generative or discriminative uh, techniques. Okay, so in general, or models, whatever you want to use, okay, classifier, model, technique. Um, when we talk about discriminative models or conditional models, also typically from a probabilistic point of view, what what it's being modeled is the dependence of the, the unobserved variables, the dependence of the dependent variables with respect to the independent variables, with respect to the variables that we observe. So in this case, for example, imagine that we are talking about the medical database scenario. The probabilities that we would be modeling are the probabilities that, um, given that we have a patient with a given heart rate and blood plate and blood pressure and so on, what's the probability of that patient having a heart attack or not, okay? The way this is done is typically by learning um, the conditional probability distribution, just what I said, okay? What's the mapping between the inputs and the class labels, between the age, heart rate, blood pressure, and the, uh, heart, uh, the heart condition label? And the way this is built is, again, by discriminating. So we are separating positive versus negative cases, or we are separating among different classes. This is all opposed to, and these are some examples of discriminative models, so for example, logistic regressions, SVMs, neural networks. And this definition is opposed to what we call generative models. So generative models do not look at the conditional probability, okay? But rather, uh, this type of models model uh, the joint probability. Okay, so what's the probability that both the observations, the um, dependent variables, and the labels, the independent variables, uh, will happen? Okay, so what's the probability that the two happen at the same time? What's the probability that we observe a person with a heart problem with a given age, blood, um, a given blood pressure? Okay. And it's learned at the same time. So we do not learn conditional probabilities, but we learn the whole um, probability distribution as latent variables. Some examples of those are, for example, naive Bayes, uh, Gaussian mixture models, hidden Markov models, or latent Dirichlet allocation, which is typically used, well, it's, it can be used for topic modeling. But in general, again, I mean, this is not something that you will be directly using, but it's important to understand that depending on whether the, on, on how the models are computed, we might be talking about generative in the sense that, okay, let's learn what are the latent variables there from the observations that we have, and everything is put together, both labels and features, versus discriminative, which is more, okay, these are the features that we have, and these are the labels that we have. How are exactly the labels conditioned by the features that we have? And let me finish by saying that in general, in general, uh, discriminative classifiers tend to yield superior performances. Okay, but again, it depends a lot on the type of data sets that we have in hand and on the research question that we are trying to answer. Okay, so let me stop here for a break and then we'll continue with logistic regressions. We'll see a little bit of theory and then we'll see an example in R.